Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalists Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn, and what you're about to hear is a live version of our podcast, which Ryan and I recorded in beautiful Salt Lake City, Utah. But first, I have three, yes, three exciting updates for you. Number one, minimalism on iTunes and Amazon. Yes, 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 yes. We heard you loud and clear. So uh, later this month, on September 30th, 2016, Minimalism, a documentary about the important things, is finally coming to iTunes and Amazon. And if you pre-order the film on either one of those platforms, it really helps us reach more people because both of those sites use these strange, complex algorithms to recommend films. Uh, For example... I'm sure you've seen, if you like that film, then you'll like this film, right? That's really based on an algorithm. And apparently, a significant part of their algorithm involves the number of pre-orders a film has, which indicates popularity or or, or whatever to the robot overlords in their cloud kingdom. Anyway, if you want to see the film on iTunes or on Amazon, we'd be grateful if you'd pre-order it today. Uh, That way it'll show up in your inbox uh, once it is released on September 30th. And, of course, our robot overlords will all be pleased with us. Of course, you can watch the film today on Vimeo. Just visit minimalismfilm.com and click on See the Film. That's also where you'll find all the iTunes and Amazon pre-order links. But no matter how you see the film or where you see the film... We really hope you find value in in this creation. We spent a ton of time and and resources on this film. And now people in 110 countries have watched the film. And so we'd love to hear what some of your favorite scenes are. Just share them using the hashtag minimalismfilm on social media. All right, update number two, our TEDx talk. In less than two weeks, more than 100,000 people have seen our second TEDx talk, which is called the Art of Letting Go. Have you checked it out yet? If not, you can find it over on our YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com slash The Minimalists. Uh, third and finally, the last writing workshop of 2016. Okay, I'm hosting this year's final How to Write Better One Day Online Workshop which is basically a stripped-down version of my four-week class. It's on Sunday, October 30th, and I don't have any planned yet for next year, so it'll be a while. This will be the last one for a while at this point. And it's recorded, so if you can't attend the live class, don't worry. You can obviously watch it afterward and still have access to all of the, the resources afterward as well. Find all the details over at howtowritebetter.org. Oh, and uh, just a heads up, seats are limited. Okay, that's it for the updates for now. I hope you enjoy this version of the Minimalists podcast and one of my favorite cities in the world, Salt Lake City, Utah. And stay tuned after the broadcast for some minimalism tips from our listeners. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to a special live version of the Minimalist Podcast. I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And we are live tonight in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> wow. You <laughs> you all are awesome. So, so thank you so much. We have a, a microphone somewhere where folks can ask questions. Usually the way that we do this podcast is uh, we take voicemails, and it would be really weird if I had you all like call us up right now. And so instead of doing that, we'll have you uh, just come on down and answer questions. There's a microphone right here in the middle. As soon as you get there, a spotlight will, will dawn on you and... Um, someone has to break the ice at, at some point in time, though. Otherwise, I'll just sit up here and interview Ryan. Okay. Sometimes you have to go backwards to go forward. <laughs> On the road, we call that a faux fundity because it sounds really profound, but it literally means nothing. 
So just give us your name and uh, whatever your question, comment, concern. Well, thank you for the, yes. the false philosophy in any case. Um, <laughs> my name is Sarita, and I, I'm a yoga teacher, and I teach people about meditation, so I really appreciated this on multiple levels and kind of came away with a different takeaway than I thought I would coming in. So my question What, what do you mean by that, a different takeaway? Well, I, I was under the impression that it was going to be one of those things where I was like, dang it, I do need to get rid of my book collection. But that's not how I felt, you know. It was, it was very interesting to say to see how I value the objects that I do have in my life. So that kind of leads into my question that I have for both of you. And obviously, there's going to be different answers from anyone in this room. But I'm just curious to know what your perspective is. And you talked a lot about the values and um, the opportunity that you've gained from from minimizing your stuff, but. I'm curious to know what each of you has to say about what your relationship with the things that you do have is. Well, I will tell you, uh, you know, getting rid of the stuff is the initial bite of the apple. It's like that that was a great first step for me. But what that really led into was uh, discovering or, or making room for the most important things in life, to, uh, making room for w what I wanted my priorities to actually be. So, you know, it's, I spent so long saying, oh, you know, my health is really important, but then, like, I'm always, you know, getting McDonald's and Burger King and, and not, uh, you know, exercising regularly, or I'd say, my relationships, those are really, really important, um, but I would see my mother maybe, you know, five or six times a year, uh, and I only lived about a half hour away from her, um, because I was too busy to, to focus on that, but, but uh, you know, our priorities are what, uh, we, uh, what, what we do, not what we say we do. And um, so getting rid of the stuff helped me to, to realize, like, wow, if I stop focusing on uh, having this big house, having this car, bringing in all of these items, um, I, I can actually make room, make the time to do those things, uh, not, not uh, keep lying to myself or, you know, planning to do that when I retire one day. I, I, I could take control a lot sooner than that. So, I mean, the stuff I have now... Um, Everything I have, it, it, it adds value. And what I mean by that is it, it serves a purpose or it brings me joy. Um, I don't keep a catalog of my stuff. Um, I couldn't tell you how many items I own. Um, that is, that is not, uh, that's just not my version of minimalism. And, and like you said, everyone kind of has their own, their own version. But the relationship I have with my stuff now, um, my physical items, it's, they're tools. They're, they're tools in my life that I use. And... There are things that I have that Josh does not have, and vice versa. I mean, I snowboard, and there's a lot of equipment that comes along with snowboarding. Um, Josh doesn't have those things because they would just sit in his closet and collect dust. They would kill me. <laughs> that's why I don't have those things. So, I mean, that's how I view stuff now. Um, people often ask, like, if you were going to, or, or if your house caught fire and, and you could only grab, you know, one or two items, like, what would you grab? And I'm thinking, like, my girlfriend, my cat. Well, it's really her cat. I guess it's kind of our cat. But, uh, but yeah, you know, like, that's, that's kind of what comes to mind. But everything else, I mean, you know, if Mariah called me right now and was like, oh, honey, the apartment caught fire and everything's gone. And then I was like, oh, that really stinks. And then, like, I hung up my phone and then my phone, like, disintegrated. I mean, I, I would not, I don't have attachment to those things anymore. Because over the last six years, I've been working so hard incorporating good habits into my life to not develop those attachments that, that, are, that are hard to, hard to sever. I, I can kind of sever that attachment pretty quickly now. So yeah, that's how I view the things in my life currently, is just, uh, just tools. Yeah, I, I would just say that I no longer give the same meaning to stuff that I once did. I used to give stuff so much meaning. My material possessions, they, they meant something to me, whether it was the, the 2,000 books that I owned, some of which I actually had read other, others of which I planned on reading one day in some non-existent hypothetical future. And, and you know, I'd go to the bookstore and buy four, five, six books at a time. And you do that enough and you just amass this huge book collection. And I realized that I was holding on to that because people would come over and say, wow, that's a beautiful bookshelf you have with all these books. And I realized that there, I had an attachment. I gave meaning to, wow, people think I'm smart from that. And, and it was a way for me to, to put up this facade, this veneer of, of intelligence as, as opposed to just you know, 
caring less about the image I tried to project onto the world and, and simply be myself. And, and I found I was doing that with a lot of stuff, whether it was the luxury cars that I had, cars, plural, um, the, the big suburban house with more toilets than people. Um, you know, all of these things that I held on to because I gave it some meaning. And now the stuff that, uh, that I have, like Ryan, I, I use it as a tool, but I'm also prepared to walk away from it at any time. And I, I live by that principle. In fact, one of my, my favorite things that I've ever written was an essay called The Things We're Prepared to Walk Away From. Uh, I don't know if you read it, but um, it's in our book called Essential. I don't want to feel like I'm selling you a book, so I'd love to give you a copy of the book afterward. I think Sean has some around here somewhere, so we'll give you a copy of that. But basically, the, the principle goes like this. Uh, uh, has anyone here seen the movie Heat with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino? There's a few of you, right? Yeah, okay. So um, th there's a sort of bad guy character in the movie, and he talks about being willing to walk away from Never bring anything into your life that you're not prepared to walk away from in 30 seconds flat, is, is the line verbatim. Now... I don't live by that prescriptively, but I think it's a good uh, guiding light uh, to, to look at anything in my life, being willing to walk away from the material things and being able to walk away from those at any point in time. Because that forces me to continue to ask the question, does this add value to my life? The things that add value to my life may not add value to my 40-year-old self or my 50-year-old self, so I have to keep asking that question. Minimalism isn't a destination. You don't get down to your 1,000 items or your 100 items, or like Colin in the film, you don't get down to your 52 items, and all of a sudden you're the ultra-minimalist and now you're happy. It's a moving target for you, and the things I bring into my life now augment that experience as opposed to uh, having some sort of made-up meaning that I'm projecting onto them. That's my short answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name my name's Miles. Uh, my first question is, I noticed there are a lot of good-looking people in the film, and I wanted to ask you about the hypothesis that being a minimalist will actually make you more attractive. <laughs> we had to balance it out because we had to put me and Ryan in the film, and then we got a bunch <laughs> of good-looking people in the film as well. Um, yeah, that's an. In I've I've never even considered that. Well, you there should was think a about that. Bunch of um, good-looking <laughs> minimalism. Yeah. It, I have fewer gray hairs now, and people tend not to believe me when I say that, but when I was 27, I was working 80 hours a week, and I was stressed out of my mind. And I remember after, after I started simplifying my life, I never jumped up and said, look at me, I'm becoming a minimalist. And, or, or I especially didn't say, look at me, I'm getting rid of all this stuff. Because then what do people say? Are you going to kill yourself? <laughs> Isn't it so weird that the, the sort of telltale sign of, of uh, uh, suicide is like removing excess stuff from our lives? Um, that's the culture that we've, 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 I've digressed significantly at this point. <laughs> well, can I, can I, uh, so my, my, my real question, my follow-up Wait, question. that wasn't a real question. No, I mean, you should really think about it, uh, but you should take some time to really. Well, wait, hold on. Let me, let me finish my long, uh, uh, circuitous answer here. Uh, 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 here's what I'll say though. I remember people at work coming to me after like six months, eight months of, I'd been simplifying my life. And toward the end of that, people at work started saying, hey, man, what is going on with you? You seem so much less stressed. You seem so much calmer. What is going on? You seem so much nicer. <laughs> and, and I realized that, like, th these were, like, additional benefits I didn't necessarily expect uh, when I first embraced, you know, simplifying my life. So I'll let you ask your real question. Yeah, Sorry. I'll just add one small thing is that happier people will come across as more attractive. And I think that those people are happier because they have instituted this philosophy into their life. And, uh, yeah, I, I agree that, yeah, it certainly could help uh, make you happier, which by default might make you a little bit more uh, appealing to others, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, also good casting, but I, mean, well, I don't know what, which, which came first. Um, but I, I do like that. The, so the, the question I have is um, you talk a lot about stuff in your, in your previous answer. It was about stuff and um, – there were parts of the of the movie that, for lack of a better word, were a little bit like I thought at the time disjointed. Like they skipped around a lot. 
But as I'm thinking about it, I guess my question is, how do you connect minimalism, or can you tell, talk a little bit about minimalism in stuff that's not stuff? Um, so, so there was one part where one of your interviewees talked about how often we look at our cell phones, and I think that might be a good example, but in what other ways is minimalism not just about stuff? Sure, I, I think for me it starts with the stuff. Uh, the, the material possessions are often a, a physical manifestation of what's going on inside us. But by clearing the, the sort of excess stuff that's going on around us, we're able to start dealing with what's going on inside us. So by, by getting rid of the excess stuff, the average American household has 300,000 items in it. And, and the truth is some of those things actually do add value to our lives, right? Many of those things make our lives better. The problem with me was I, I didn't know which of those 300,000 items and what percentage of them did add value to my life. And now the paradox as a minimalist is the things that I own now, I get far more value from those things than if they were watered down by 300,000 items and, and having all these things in the way. But then after the stuff is when it led to all these other areas in life. And Ryan and I wrote about this in, in our first book. It's a book called Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. Again, don't want to sell you a copy, so I'd love to give you a copy afterward. Um, and, and basically, after removing those things, I realized that I didn't even know what was important in my life anymore. I'd gotten to that point where these things I thought were impor important, so-called success and achievement and, and, and the trinkets of, of success, the, uh, the accumulation of stuff, like that wasn't important to me anymore. And so I needed to figure out what was important. And so Ryan and I came up with these five areas uh, in life that, that we identified that were these sort of higher order values. We call them the five values of, of living a meaningful life. Uh, the first one's health. You know, I used to weigh 80 pounds more than I weigh now. And I wasn't just fat, like I felt like crap. And, and so it affected all other areas of my life. Uh, the second area was relationships. I said my relationships were a priority, but I didn't treat the people closest to me as though they were a priority to me. It's the reason my marriage ended. I, I, I forsook the relationships closest to me and instead spent a ton of time with those secondary or tertiary relationships, especially those tertiary relationships, coworkers, acquaintances, networking buddies, executives, these types of people. There was nothing wrong with those people. Just many of them didn't share my my values or my beliefs or my interests, my desires. And, and I realized that because I was allocating all my time to those folks, I wasn't allocating to the, uh, to the time to the people closest to me. Uh, the third area we talked about in, in that book uh, was passion, or you might say craft or creativity, something like that. But focusing on what you're passionate about, cultivating something into a passion, finding something that aligns with your values and and, and finding a way to be passionate about that or, or creative in that way. And the last two areas go together, uh, growth and contribution. I found that I really wasn't growing in what I was doing in my life before. And, and because I wasn't growing, I felt like I didn't have that much to give. I wasn't contributing to my community. I wasn't contributing to the world in a meaningful way. And I find that by stopping the focus of, on the stuff, I was able to start focusing on those five areas. And I, I'm really only as strong as the, the weakest link there. And, and really, you could call it a, a meaningful life or just a well-balanced life. I find that if I'm ever feeling discontented, I have to go back to those five areas and say, okay, what am I forsaking now? Because you can have four of those areas, but if you don't have your health, then you really don't have anything. Or if you don't feel like you're contributing to the world, well, you're going to feel very solipsistic and, and really like a parasite a in a way. And so I find I always have to go back to those five areas and, and question, you know, are my actions that I'm doing today, are my short-term actions aligned with my long-term values? And I think that leads to happiness. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, though, I, I don't think happiness is the point. And I think we, we get confused with that a lot. Uh, we, we chase happiness. And I, in fact, I think discontent is a byproduct of chasing happiness. And in fact, I found that by living a meaningful life, I was able to be happy without chasing that thing called happiness. And then, yeah, I would say it, it, it bled into other areas of life too. Technology, 
Uh, we did a whole podcast episode about about technology, um, and and just talking about you know cutting that which is superfluous, digital clutter, and, and and things like that. And you start to ask the same question that you asked about your stuff: Does this add value to my life? You start to ask that about virtually everything from technology to relationships to the way we're spending our time to you know, the entertainment we consume, etc. All right, I had a, a couple questions, but uh, I'll narrow it down to maybe four. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, first and foremost, like, you guys have been doing this for how long? About six years. Six years. Do you guys ever feel pressure um, to maintain an example of what you guys are doing? Or is it just literally become who you are? Yeah, for me, it's literally become who I am. Um, I would say that this is a great way to help me stay motivated to, to keep uh, on, this, on this road. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, I don't find myself making decisions based on oh my God, what are my readers going to think about this decision? I, I, that never pops into my head. Um, if anything pops into my head, it's, man, Ryan, uh, you really want to be a good example, don't you? And, and uh, you know, doing this is going to be a good example, not just for everyone who reads our stuff, not just for, you know, the, the, the 12-year-old, you know, kid who, who I just met walking out of the, of the screening or, um, you know, the high school kids that show up or the college kids or whatever. It's, it's, it's am I going to be a good example for myself, too? I mean, kind of like what Josh said, you know, now I, I find myself striving to be the best, like, 40-year-old version of myself. So w whether, you know, we had the minimalists.com or not, I would still be striving to, to be the best 40-year-old version of myself. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly um, there is uh, an aspect there that drives me to be a good example, um, but that, that's not... That, that's a very small piece of why I do what I do, I guess. I have a friend who was at a, uh, she was at a shopping mall a few years ago, and she sent me a text message, and she's like, I'm getting ready to buy this thing, but I would like, I, I, I'm always thinking, what would Joshua do? <laughs> and it's like, you know, those little bracelets. That she's like, I'm going to get one of those bracelets that says WWJD. And, um, and I, it, the, the funny thing about that was, I think that's great advice, but not like what would I do, but what would you, the best version of yourself do in any scenario? And so I'm constantly asking myself, what would the best version of myself do here? And really what that means is, are these actions in line with my longer term values? Or is this a, a sh sort of short term pacifier that, that um, you know, I'm trying to, to fill some sort of void with? And so, yeah, I think I'm constantly trying to make decisions. As, as the best version of myself. And I think if I, if I am being as close to the best version of myself as I can be, then it tends to, to just sort of by proxy set a, a good example for others. Yeah, I'll tell you, that's like the biggest thing I love about this is like I feel honored to be able to be a role model or an example for, for other people. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it is a huge honor for sure. Um, so, yeah, it, it it's definitely drives me uh, to continue to, to be that good example. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. And then my last question, sorry. What's your um, name, by the way? Elijah. Elijah, it's mm -hmm. good to meet you, brother. Good to meet you all. Um, so we live in Utah, and a lot of people have kids here. And uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I know some of y'all are gonna want your kids to be like this, because I do. I mean, I was completely opposite, you know, I was a ma maximist, whatever you call it, the opposite of what y'all are. Um, but so I'm, was I'm, I. Okay. And I'm really, literally, in my last, literally about the last year, I've really tried to undo that. And it's weird. It's, it's, it's just kind of naturally happening. And it's kind of cool to, oh, it's not the most expensive thing anymore that I picked out. And I don't really need that car anymore. So it's, it's a good feeling. So I'm just trying to really figure out, I'm, you guys aren't parents, though, right? Yeah, I am, but, oh. but he's not. Okay. Yeah. So have you been a parent the whole time you've... No, okay. no. So uh, I guess my question is, how the, how do we teach our kids that have been taught opposite this lifestyle? <laughs> Ryan, uh, since you're not a parent, 
give him some advice. Yes. <laughs> it's really easy for me to give advice since I don't have any kids. Um, I'll tell you something that one of our uh, audience members um, in, during our 2014 tour um, said that they did with their kids, which was, I thought was pretty cool. So from a very uh, young age, um, she has been trying to incorporate these this philosophy, these types of thoughts with her kid. And she said, you know, when uh, when her five-year-old daughter would come home from school with like an art project, she'd be like, oh, you know, this is this is what I did today and I'd really like to hang it on the fridge, is that okay? And she's like, yeah, uh, we can totally uh, put that on the refrigerator. Now the refrigerator is already covered in art projects. So they go over to the refrigerator and she's like, okay, which one would you like to take down and uh, replace this one with and then they kind of go through this whole process where the kid will pick which art project they want to take down and then they walk over and and throw it away sometimes uh, she said she would like take a picture of of the project that they were throwing away just so she could have it put it in you know the digital cloud um, but yeah I mean certainly uh, there's there are things like that she does the same thing with toys um, when you know if the kid wants something uh, her big thing was that she hated to tell her kids no so she will tell them yes as often as possible. So if, you know, her daughter comes to her and says, you know, I really want this toy, if it's appropriate and they can afford it, she'll say, great, we can totally get that toy. Um, let's pick something else that we can donate and have another child benefit from. So I, I thought that was a pretty cool way of, of, of approaching it. But ultimately, I'll say, you know, I, uh, and Joshua Becker touched on this. I mean, our kids, our kids, <laughs> kids, <laughs> I don't have kids, um, kids are, are watching their parents. And, and I know... When I was a child, how 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 closely I watched my parents. I know um, I have like my I have siblings. My oldest sibling is uh, 13 years younger than me, or I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, about that, 12 years younger than me. Um, but I know that even watching them grow up and watching me, I knew that I was setting an example for them. So um, ultimately, I would say your kids are definitely watching, and the the better example you can set for them and show them the benefits of, of this philosophy and why you apply it to your life, the more apt they're going to embrace it in their own. Yeah, I would just say what I've learned, um, so Ella turns three this week, so she's still, you know, toddler age. Um, kids are sort of naturally minimalist, man. They just don't give a damn about the, uh, the amassing of stuff. But over time, of course, what happens is... They, they are watching parents, as Ryan said, but they're watching everything else that goes on around them as well. And you saw uh, Juliet Shore kind of talk about the, you know, the advertising to children and, and that whole industry, which is a you know, multi-billion dollar industry now and has grown exponentially since the 80s and especially in, in the 90s and, and since then. And, and so kids are paying attention and all of us see 5,000 advertisements a day. Right, but children are shaped more by those, but by those uh, bits of input, than than we are. It's not that we aren't; we certainly are, but they're going to be shaped far more. And the best way to to influence them to I is well, here, here's the question: Your kids are going to get brainwashed. Who's going to brainwash them? You or the advertisements? I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll just add one thing, too. Um, going back to what Joshua Becker said in the movie, you know, you don't want to, like, lock your kids in an empty room. You don't want to just, like, throw all their stuff out. As parents, uh, you do have the ability to set boundaries for them, though. So there are certainly boundaries you can set with um, the things they bring into their lives, like a one-in, one-out type situation, or um, even, like, setting up, like, the type of entertainment that they take in. Hold on. The one-in, one-out, doesn't that kind of go into the film of how we're talking about the newest, latest, greatest, always upgrading. I, I think it could cycle. lead to that. Cer I think it could certainly lead to that. Um, that's, that's, I'm not saying that every time your kid wants something that you say yes, as long as they get rid of something else. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that it, it, you could approach uh, some decisions in the household that way, certainly. And I think ultimately it comes down to asking, asking more questions, too. I find that even, even with a, a three-year-old, I'm constantly asking her questions. Why do you want that? And it, it, sometimes it backfires on me because she's constantly asking me the same you know, questions. Over, she's asking me why a million times a day. Um, and, and so I find that asking, asking questions uh, quite often gets to the, to the purpose behind the want, right? Quite often we want something. 
I know I certainly did throughout my 20s. I didn't know why I wanted that second Lexus, but I wanted it. And, and when you get down to the purpose behind it, and we train ourselves to understand what that purpose is, it, if you do that enough over time, it becomes less of an intellectual exercise. Where why do you want this? Why does this add value to your life? And over time, it becomes a more visceral or emotional exercise because if you program yourself or your, your kids to ask these important questions, what's my own definition of, of success? Who's the person I want to become? Why have I given so much meaning to these material possessions? Questions like that, if we're programming ourselves and our children to ask those questions more frequently, then, then we're going to be in a much better position th than if we just you know, placate them. And then, of course, yeah, we, uh, we set up some rules along the way because that's what we need to do as parents. But uh, asking those questions alongside the rules, I find, find helps me out a lot. I'm cool. just going to add one more thing. <laughs> 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 no, uh, go to, go to theminimalists.com slash children. And okay. um, there is an essay there that Leo Babauta uh, wrote for us. Um, it's called Minimalism, or No Excuses, Minimalism with Kids. And there's also a, a recommendation, a book by Joshua Becker, um, that, that I think will really... Um, add value to because I, I always feel guilty giving advice on kids when I don't have any kids but <laughs> those are two 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 gentlemen who have um, pretty you know significant families and, and they have wrote about uh, wrote about how they kind of approach it with their children what yeah Leo's that? the guy with six kids so what yeah was that again? it's the minimalists.com slash children all right and uh, yeah Leo has an essay there and uh, Joshua Becker's book clutter free with kids great thank you thanks man so my name is Landon, and right now I'm in college, and I really want to share this with a lot of my friends, but the problem is a lot of them are there pursuing a degree to make a lot of money. Sure. And so they're well, really Let me hesitant. ask you a question. I don't mean to cut you off, and yeah. I'll let you finish your question. Okay. What, what's wrong with making a lot of money? There's nothing wrong with it, I guess, but I don't know if they have really another, any other reason for their degree except for that. That's just, like, why they're there. Okay. And I want to try and share this with them but they're hesitant or kind of cynical because it goes against everything they've been like kind of working towards. And so I'm wondering if you have some advice on how to, how to share this with people who might be pretty hesitant towards the idea. Yeah, I can tell you I have never recommended uh, one of our books or an essay without being solicited for help. So I've never like sent my mom an essay like, hey, I wrote this for you, mom. That You really need to read this because you're not getting it. Um, that's, it's, and, and Josh didn't come to me and say, hey, Ryan, you got a lot of shit, man. You need to read this stuff. Uh, it was more about me seeing the benefits and going to Josh and saying, dude, why the hell are you so happy? What is going on, man? Like, you just went through all this crazy stuff. Like, are you on drugs or what, dude? And uh, that's when he told me about minimalism. Um, but I, I would encourage you to do the, the same thing with, with your friends. Um, if they are asking you for help, if, if you see them in turmoil, if you see them stressing over uh, o over something that you feel like, you know, uh, a book um, or an essay or whatever from from a, uh, someone who, I don't want you to just recommend our books and essays. There's plenty of other books and e essays to recommend um, on minimalism. But if, if there's an opportunity for you to help your friend in a situation where you see that they're having pain with, then I think that would be a perfect, uh, perfect time to interject. But yeah, I, I agree, man. Like just going to someone and, and saying, hey, I, you know, I read this book on minimalism, even though your intentions are great, and, like, you're really not trying to call them out on anything. When you approach someone when they haven't solicited for help and you're offering them a piece of advice, they're automatically going to feel some sort of judgment. And, and as soon as they feel that judgment, that's where they will start to project, and that's where they will start to get cynical. Yeah, I, I would just ask, how do you get your friends to play ice hockey? I mean, w when I think about, about that question, it's like, man, it'd be really difficult if I just wanted to force my, my friends to start playing ice hockey right now, especially since I don't play ice hockey. But, but I, I think you can't really force anyone into that situation, but, but if, if, there is, if there is an underlying discontent there, they may not see it yet. It sounds to me like, like what you're saying is their definition of, of success is 
is making more, making a, a significant amount of money. And that, that's why I asked that question earlier. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with, with making money. I think we all need to make some money to earn a, earn a living. The problem becomes when it is our sole driver for doing what we do. And when it becomes the point of doing what we do. And in fact, it's a, weird, it's a weird thing, right? It's the first question we ask when we meet someone. What do you do? Wow, that's such an expansive question when you really think about it. Well, I go to concerts, I watch movies, I take long walks on the beach. Oh, you're asking me how much money do I make, where do I work, so you can compare me to you on the socioeconomic ladder. But if we posit the question that way, we seem like a mean person. And, and so instead we say, what do you do? And then we spend the next you know, 15 minutes talking about what we do to earn a living. And if that's what you're passionate about, I think that's awesome. But, but it's not always what you're passionate about. And so I think what you do doesn't have to be what you do to earn a paycheck. And, and when I think about what I do, I flip that question around. When someone asks me, what do you do? I say I'm really passionate about writing. I don't say I'm a writer because then you start getting these weird accusatory questions. Who's your publisher? How many books have you written? Uh, you can make a living off that. Um, and instead I say I'm really passionate about writing. And I say, what are you passionate about? And they'll say, oh, I'm passionate about snowboarding or this or that or whatever. And it changes the trajectory of our, of our conversations. And someone may say, I'm really passionate about accounting and I'm an accountant. That's great. And then we can at least talk about what they're passionate about. And so I, I find that when, if you have friends that you think you would, that they would get value from, from a documentary like this or a book or whatever, that, that's one of the reasons that we made the film was, you know, during the intro we, we kind of talked about uh, we've, you know, this has become a multimedia project for us. We, we started a, a podcast and we have the blog and we have books and we're just constantly finding new ways to communicate with people because I realize that fewer than 50% of American males read a book a year. So, uh, so they read less than one book a year um, is the stat, which to me is zero books a year. Um, so, so there has to be other avenues to communicate with people. So it may not be the documentary. May maybe that's too long. Maybe it's our, our TED Talk. I think it's a, a great introduction. We did a 15-minute TED Talk. A and letting people decide for themselves. Because one, one thing I can't do is project this lifestyle on to someone else. I can simply provide a recipe, and that's what we're doing right now. We're not here to convert anyone to minimalism but we want to share our recipe in hopes that you can tweeze out a few ingredients and maybe live a, a more meaningful life because of it. It's a way that we can contribute. Hi. Howdy. Um, well, Joshua, you and I actually met last year when, um, yeah, you uh, came to Weller Bookworks with uh, Colin Wright and Courtney Carver, and you and I have the same birthday. Awesome. June yeah. 29th. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I had this, you signed it. What'd you get me? <laughs> Hot. Just kidding, I hope no. nothing. <laughs> it's like, you're a minimalist, aren't you? So, um, yeah, Ryan, you weren't there, so boo. But anyway. I'm sorry. <laughs> I divided and conquered um, that tour. <laughs> um, well, actually, I just wanted to start off with a huge thank you because um, I was introduced to minimalism about a year ago. You know, like I came to that signing and. Um, you know, it's changed my life in, you know, more ways than I can count where it's like, you know, I found much more meaningful relationships in like the past, you know, six months than I did like the two years before that. And like I've started school because I know like the things I want to do. I found a sport that I love for like physical activity and I'm actually starting up a business. So it's like all this has allowed me like the time and energy and money and clarity in order to, you know, act on the things I want to do. So first want to Thank you for that. Wow, this sounds like, this is like an infomercial ad here. <laughs> I, you are awesome. Thank you. Yep. Um, first question, it's kind of a selfish question, but uh, when can I expect a hug and signature from Ryan at some point? Uh, well, you're stealing my thunder, but we're going to do that later tonight. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then the other question being, I am somewhat approaching the end of kind of my, um, like clutter clearing journey, you know, like physically, mentally, digitally, you know, like I'm at a point, I'm getting fairly close to where it's like all the stuff in my space I do like use on a daily basis. Um, but I live with my dad and I recognize that he comes from like a generation of, you know, you, you have like 
all the furniture that you need. Then once your parent dies off, they you just inherit everything from them. As opposed to where something I pointed out to him is that we we kind of live in this you know cycle of like this is something that I got use of at this stage in my life. Now I'm letting it go off to be used by someone else. You know, it's it's a cycle, and so and. He, he's been struggling with especially things that he's gotten me in the past where I used to get used from it and I used to love it, but now it's just taking up space and I'm not using it. So I guess advice for helping me help him see that I'm not just throwing stuff away, giving stuff away, that I'm just, it's going to find a new purpose with someone else. Um, well, I can tell you a story about uh, my mom that I'm sure some people here have heard. Maybe you've heard it too. Stop me if you've heard this one. Um, no, so uh, my mom called me up uh, like a month after the website was um, was up, and she's like, hey, son, how's it going? I'm like, it's going great, mom. What are you up to? Oh, nothing much. Uh, what's this minimalist crap? <laughs> I was like, oh, you found the website, because like, we hadn't advertised it. She uh, must have been Googling my name or something. And uh, she's like, well, what is going on? Like, are you not going to be around for holidays anymore? Like, are you depressed? can I not buy you stuff anymore? Like, what is going on with you? And I was like, uh, well, no, Mom, I really hope uh, that I'll be around, not just for holidays, but I hope I'll be around more. Because right now, that's about the only time I see you. Um, I really hope that I can, um, you know, use this path to kind of help me uh, free up some time so I can develop our relationship a little bit more. And I said, yeah, uh, yeah, I am depressed, actually. That's why I am in this rut that I need to get out of. That is why I am refocusing um, what I'm doing with, with my time and my resource, my other resources. And, um, and I it was like, yeah, I, and as far as buying me stuff, yeah, please don't buy me anything. I would really appreciate that. And she was like, okay, um, really glad to hear you're, you know, making your life better and all that. Uh, I'm still going to buy you stuff, though. I'm your mother. <laughs> And I suppose, like, she has that right as my mom to say that. Um, I was like, okay, well, if you buy me something that I can't use, if it doesn't serve a purpose or, or bring me joy, if it's just going to sit and collect dust, I'm going to have to give it to someone else or donate it. or I'm going to have to find it in another home. That's not the thing to say to your mom. Um, she got pretty upset, <laughs> and we started going back and forth. Uh, and eventually, um, I just you know, kind of wound her down a little bit um, by just, you know, saying, Mom, I love you so much. Like, you love me, right? She's like, yeah, of course I love you. And I'm like, I want you to be happy. You want me to be happy too, right? She's like, yeah, of course I want you to be happy. I'm like, well, if that's the case, I just need you to support me. So I, I was just asking her for support. Um, you know, I told her, look, you don't have to have a packing party. You don't have to become a minimalist. Uh, you don't have to tidy your house up before I come over. I'm not going to come to your home and judge your things. This is about me living a meaningful life. This is about me um, really trying to be happier uh, so I can free up time and, and other resources to do things that are important. And you are important to me, and this is going to help me do that. And uh, that's what really kind of got through to her. So I would I would encourage you to... Uh, to have that similar conversation with your father and, and, you know, and ask him that, you know, if he would just be willing to support you on this journey because it is making you happier. Because ultimately, he does want you to be happy. I'm sure he does. Right. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, that's definitely not an issue with my mom. She's here with me. So. <laughs> hey, if you come down here right now, I'm pretty sure Ryan will be happy to give you a hug. Come on down. <laughs> I even have a Sharpie. I'll sign your book. Well, uh, we'll do, I just got the wrap up from Sean, so we can do one more question here, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up for everyone. I Howdy. That's me. Awesome. Sweet. Um, What's well, your name? Jen. Hey, Carpenter. Jen. Um, I'm from Utah County. Um, and my question, well, first of all, thank you. The movie was much, I gained a lot of value out of it, and we were driving up here, and I thought, oh, I hope it's as good as the podcast. I hope it's as good as they are, because my sister and I have a weekly date, usually Wednesday, Thursday. It's like, oh, have you listened to Travel? Have you listened to Miami? So it's a constant <laughs> battle back and forth. Um, but I have found a lot of value. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Um, but I started my journey probably about a year and a half ago. Um, we'd moved 21 times in 17 years of marriage, three kids later. I thought you were going to say 21 times in a year and a half. No. That would be epic. That's like, that's more than Colin Wright. I, I don't know if epic would be the word, but 
Um, so I started unpacking a lot of things, and I mean, I literally have gotten rid of so much stuff. And I just bought the Doxy, which is probably been the best thing ever. For those of you who don't know, uh, Doxy is a, uh, the scanner I used for... Uh, it's happening. It's not like a puppy or anything. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really great scanner I used. Uh, so, so Ryan did this thing called a packing party. You, you, you all may have heard of this. So he packed up all his stuff as if he were moving, unpacked everything over 21 days, and it was an experiment. And to follow up to that, I took all of my photos and and about this this doxy scanner to because uh, you remember those old scanners where you'd like lift the lid up and you put one damn picture on there you close <laughs> the lid and you go back to your computer and yeah it would make this the fax machine sound and it was and some of them actually were fax machines um, and and so I bought this scanner where you could just feed these photos through relatively quickly and I've invited some friends over we had a scanning party so he had his packing party I had a scanning party see it turns out if you put party at the end of anything Ryan shows up <laughs> and and so yeah we had a scanning party uh, I think you can read about that at the minimalists.com slash scanning for those of you who want more information on that way, I can I can let you finish your question. Okay, no, you're good. Thanks, Jen. So my question is, so I started scanning on Sunday, got through about 100, 150 things, and started, you know. Did you do it by yourself, or well, did you have friends yeah. over? Yeah, oh, no. Oh, no, okay. my kids were downstairs, husband was sleeping, okay. and I was just, you know, kept going, watching TV. And um, my question is, and I'm not very techy, but... What digital cloud service do you use, or what have you guys done to where you've made it very accessible? Because my plan is to take all of this to blurb books and do yearbooks for yeah. my family. But in the interim, do I take it to an external hard drive? Sure. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you cloud. what I did. Uh, so first off, I, and I'll, I will try not to get too much in the weeds here, but I, I named the files, whoever's in the picture, and the location, and if I know the year, I'll put that. It's not the most organized system in the world, but if it's Ryan, Sean, and Jeff, then it'll say Ryan, Sean, Jeff, Dallas, 2016. Kay. That's the file name. Did and you do that once you've uploaded it to your computer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I scanned in only the, the photos I knew I wanted. I didn't scan in all my photos, but there were hundreds of them for sure, right. if not thousands. Um, because, it's by the way, it's so much better than... It, I don't know if you were anything like me, but I used to have all these photos in like uh, a box in the attic, a box in the basement, a box in a closet somewhere, and they never get used. Or worse, I, I would stick them in photo albums and then force those photo albums onto company. Real photos. Uh, yeah, <laughs> real, the real photos. And here's the thing. If you ever have a, a flood, fire, whatever, uh, all of a sudden all those pictures are ruined if they're sitting in your basement and there's you know, water damage or whatever. But by storing them digitally, they're now backed up forever. Uh, I do have an external hard drive that I use, and then I, I, use, uh, I just use Dropbox. I don't, uh, that, that's the, the service that I prefer. It seems to be the most intuitive. But they're all pretty similar, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm not endorsing a particular uh, cloud service. Um, that, that just happens to be the one I use. And then um, instead of doing the, the stupid uh, uh, photo album, I did b digital picture frames, which, by the way, you can upload straight from your computer now via Wi-Fi. And so you can basically scan the photo, and all of a sudden, you have this rotating photo album. And now when people come over, they're like, oh, that was the time you are in Hawaii. They actually care to see the photos. For some reason, once you digitize it, it, it aggregates our eyeballs to the screen in a way that, that, that maybe a photo album wouldn't. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Cool. Last question. We want to see more into your lives as far as your child by proxy and also your significant others. Is that something that we will see in the future? Yeah, so, so Ella is, she'll be three in, in a couple of days. You can follow her on Twitter. She's, uh, she has a Twitter account. Yes. Kids really do say the darndest <laughs> things and then they get tweeted. She's at Ella Sandwich on Twitter. Um, and yeah, I mean, you'll probably see more of that uh, as, as time goes on, for sure. I mean, cool. uh, I do have a private life, but I, 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 I am okay with sharing anything that serves the greater good. Mm -hmm. and, and that tends to be where I draw my line. That, that there is a, uh, my, my online self is no different from my in-person self. Um, 
just as I have a, per a personal life, a private life here as a private citizen, but I also have a you know, public life here, it's going to be the same exact thing online. And so, yeah, you'll, you'll see more and more of that in, in the coming months for sure. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right, before uh, we wrap it up, uh, is Nate Pfeiffer here anywhere? Nate? No. Oh. Well, um, so I don't, did y'all like the music in the film? Yeah. Uh, there's a few people. So <laughs> I, I got to tell you this. Every time I, I come back to Utah, and, and we, we go here quite a bit, I feel like I'm back amongst my people. Uh, and, and there's a, a great music scene here, especially in Provo. And a journalist <laughs> asked me recently, um, if you were trapped on a desert island, uh, so a you know, pretty plausible scenario here, if you were trapped on a desert island and you could listen to only one CD, and, and I'd have to, I had to tell him I don't have a CD player, but I assume this, this desert island has a CD player. If you could listen to only one CD on a, uh, on a, a desert island, um, what would it be? And uh, there's a band who's originally from Provo called Parlor Hawk, and their second album is uh, an album called Parlor Hawk. And the, the lead singer of that band is a guy named Andrew Kapaner. And the guy who produced that album is a Grammy-nominated producer named Nate Pfeiffer, who also lives in Provo. And I begged them for about six months to do the soundtrack to this film. And over that time, we, we became really good friends. And uh, Andrew agreed, and he got Nate on board. And they filmed a band just for this, this soundtrack. And uh, they called it We, V-V-E. And I think, I think they're releasing the soundtrack within the next week or so. When uh, So the film comes out in hundreds of theaters May 24th. Uh, and uh, they're going to put the, the soundtrack out there as well. But they are they're some sort of local heroes here. And I'm really grateful for their music because I think it made the movie about 435% better. So uh, can we give them a round of applause? I want to say thanks. <laughs> And it's really hard work going, doing everything that we do and going out on the road, um, but Ryan and I don't work nearly as hard as the one man behind the scenes of all of this. He's the producer of our podcast. He's the editor of our books. He's our tour manager, our road manager, and really he does everything operational for the minimalists, and he's the one who also made the bird call earlier. But he's right over here. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Harding. Sean is the hardest working man in minimalism, uh, for sure. Are the folks from Bluehost here tonight? Yeah? Can we get you to stand up real quick? There's just one of you. There's two of you. All right. I'm pretty sure there's more. They, they had to leave. They had to get back down to, to the Provo area. So, uh, first off, I, I, well, so we started this website, theminimalists.com, like, like six years ago. And when we started it, we could not even spell HTML. And I remember calling Ryan one day and saying, man, I cannot do this. This sucks. Uh, it's not meant for me, like uh, building a website. And then we figured out about this thing called WordPress, and we finally figured out how to cobble together a really simple blog. And um, we've had a great hosting company for years now who has hosted our, our website. And the reason I tell you that is because I called them up a few months before uh, go starting this tour, and, and they're, they're actually based here as well, um, well, they're down in Provo. Um, and I, I, I called him up and said, hey, uh, we're about to go on this tour, and it's really expensive. Would you be willing to help us out? And they didn't ask for anything, but they've been really supportive of this message, uh, of this simple living message and getting it out into the world. And I said, hey, we're trying to get this documentary out to as many people as possible, and I think this tour is going to help us do that. And so they're really the reason we're able to afford getting out on the road and and you know, we've been to you know, more than a dozen cities now bringing this documentary out to them. And we couldn't do it if it weren't for the folks over at, at Bluehost. So I want to say thank you so much for being a part of this. And what about this theater? Oh, my God, we've been in a dozen theaters. This is definitely the most awesome theater, mainly because of these recliners here. This is awesome. They've been really great to us, and I just want to say thank you so much to them for having us here tonight. Thank you.
you enjoyed the film, it will be showing in hundreds of theaters starting May 24th. You can also request your own screening at your local theater at minimalismfilm.com. Uh, you just click on see the film. Uh, it's also available for pre-order right now. Uh, because this was a sold-out screening, anyone who pre-orders the film or attends a, a sold-out uh, theatrical screening of the film is going to get an email with uh, six hours of additional bonus interviews and content. When we went out and filmed this thing, we got about a thousand hours worth of content. Now a lot of those were like just weird sunrises and sunsets. And, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> we chanted I think every single state throughout, throughout the tour. Nevada made it. Uh, but yeah, there's, a, there's a, in fact a lot of this film, as you all could see, was, was filmed here in Utah. Um, and, and so you're gonna get about six hours, 20 or so different interviews and extra videos uh, for that. So stay tuned, that'll be out. Uh, in online August 2nd. All the details for that are at theminimalists.com slash order if you want to pre-order a copy of that. But you're going to get all the, the six hours. You don't have to do anything. There's no purchase required. Um, let's see here. Uh, if you ever thought about connecting with open-minded, like-minded people locally, uh, you can go to minimalist.org. There is a, a free local meetup group here. In 2014, we left behind 100 free local meetup groups for a, a just people, because people come up to us and they say, it's great you're here for a day, but now you're leaving and I can't find anyone locally who knows what the hell this minimalism thing's about. Well, the truth is there are plenty of people locally and, and we want to give you the opportunity to connect with them. Is, is Jordan here tonight, the, the community leader? Yeah. yeah. Let's give Jordan a round of applause. So, so these meetup groups meet often once a month, sometimes more, uh, just depending on what your schedules look like. And you can talk about whatever you want, decluttering, minimalism, relationships, career, uh, hair care products, whatever, you, whatever you're interested in, really. And, and um, you can just find all the information at that or any of our other cities at minimalist.org. Um, let's see here. Well, uh, after, after all of this, uh, Ryan and I will... Um, be, we're going to form a line sort of down this aisle. So if you want to grab a hug, as you can see in the film, they are free. Now here's what I'll, a, a warning to you. Our hugs are much better than they were in the film. <laughs> We've learned a lot about the art and science of hugging over the last few years, and especially after reviewing the game day tapes uh, a bunch. I, I have learned that my hug was inadequate for a long time. And so you can come judge my hug if you want to. Um, and, and can maybe compare hugs. And then, of course, you can pass it. No, no, no. Well, uh, to you it's not. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, you can come on down, grab a hug afterward. We'll have some, uh, some books here as well. Uh, if you didn't bring a wallet or you can't afford a book, don't worry about it. Um, you can, well, it's on us. Feel free to grab a book afterward. We'd love to, love to give you one. Pass it on to someone else. Minimize it afterward when you're done, obviously. The value's in the words, not in, in the artifact itself. So if you want to get a hug, this will be the line over here. Grab a book. If you don't want to touch sweaty, sweaty minimalists, then you can just feel free to exit whenever, whenever you want. And um, lastly, I want to thank you for being here. You could be anywhere else in the world tonight. You chose to spend a few hours with us, and we are really grateful. And if you leave here with one message, I hope it's this. Love people and use things, because the opposite never works. Thanks for your time, y'all. Hi, guys. Um, I am calling in response to Anna's question on the Consumerism podcast. This has been in your show notes before, but I felt like it was really valuable to her question. Um, there's a great documentary called The True Cost that basically um, teaches us what the true cost of all those cheap clothes that we're buying is, how it affects the communities in which they're made and our environment. And on their website, they have a list of um, clothing companies and clothing websites that their production aligns with the values talked about in uh, the documentary. So that's a great place to start if you don't even know which brands don't do sweatshops or you know, use non-toxic dyes and that kind of thing. Hi, my name is Dory from Portland, Oregon. I had a tip about how to be a minimalist with raising kids. For a long time now, we have given our kids at Christmas time 
a catalog from Heifer International, which is a um, the organization that helps to end poverty and empower women and children and families uh, in third world countries. And so what we do is we give our kids, kids some money and then they have to pick out a cause in the catalog. So, for instance, you can buy a whole goat for $120 or a share of a goat for just $10. So that is a way to get the kids thinking beyond themselves and get in the spirit of giving, and they don't end up with more stuff, and it's really, they look forward to it, and they it's exciting to see what they want to do with their money and how they pull it together or not pull it together, and I just recommend that website, H E I S E R. Dot org. Thanks so much. My name is Leandro Gonzalez from Las Vegas, Nevada. I was recently listening to your podcast about consumerism, and a woman spoke about not wanting to use a sweatshop product. Uh, I want to clarify that uh, as a student of economics, that in a lot of these third world countries, the alternative for these people that work in sweatshops it's a lot worse. It could be robbery, it could be crime, it could be prostitution. So in a way, these sweatshops are actually a good thing for their standard of living. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong. I just want to clarify that if we were to boycott products from sweatshop companies, then a lot of those workers would be out of work and in a worse situation than before. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for, and you gotta grab, oh I bet that you be fine without it. So tear your eyes away, or tear your eyes away. 